developing a game is some of the hardest programming you'll ever do. This is where we get our hands dirty. My name is Davis Bitsky, and I'm going to hit you with a ton of technology. Game loops, animations, sound, music, handling touch, as well as incorporating new hardware sensors like the accelerometer. You'll find it all here this week, so let's get to it. Last week, we talked about a game loop. So what does a game loop look like in practice? What I have here is the Win8 game kit code, and we are in the default JS file. What you can see is the game starts after the DOM content loaded event with the initialize function. If we drill into initialize, you can see we are using just a standard HTML5 canvas that is a function called update. This is the game loop, and in fact, it is the sample code we showed previously. We are using a technology called request animation frame that will call an update function a certain amount of times each second. Since request animation frame is hardware accelerated, it syncs itself to the refresh rate of our screen. So for example, on my own machine, it'll try to call the update method 60 times per second. In essence, 60 times per second, we will check for updates in our game, both player input as well as animation calculations, and then we will draw those changes to the screen. The easiest way to do animations is by moving the objects in an X or Y direction. An animation can be as simple as changing our X coordinates by a certain amount each frame. This is what I did in the Win8 game kit. For example, to move a ship from the right side of the screen to the left side so that it looks like it's flying across, we would change the X position by 100 pixels each second. This would give the appearance of the ship flying from right to left. Now, let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's say each time our player gains a new level, the ships move faster. This will make the difficulty more and more challenging as we progress through the game. The difficulty can be a simple multiplier that increases the amount of pixels the ship moves. So instead of moving 100 pixels per second, I move 200 pixels per second, or a factor of twice as much. You could get really creative with this scenario with things like special weapons, or maybe with a power-up time bomb. I can slow down time, and in essence, my ship moves only 20 pixels per second, or one-fifth of their normal speed. We can also use more advanced concepts like sprite sheets. A sprite sheet is one long image you pre-render that can be broken up into multiple images at predefined pixels. If I have a thousand pixel long sprite sheet, like you see here, I can say every hundred pixels is a new frame for that image. This will give me an animation of 10 frames per second. In this example, our character will turn from one side to the other. Let's dig a little deeper into both music and sound effects. In the Win8 Game Kit example, we have three types of sound going on. On our main menu, you will hear background music. Then when you start the game, you hear different background music playing. Both of these music tracks were created using standard HTML5 audio tags. We simply declare the tags in JavaScript, set the loop property to true, and then tell each audio tag which sound file to play. To switch out the different music tracks, we call their play and pause functions appropriately. Using this technique allows us to play different music on the menu screen and during the game. We can also use third-party libraries here. For example, Sound.js will wrap the same HTML5 audio tags for us and allow us to load them into an array. Occasionally, when we have a lot of sound effects on screen, they can get cut off. Remember that users have 10 fingers, and on a touch device, that can mean 10 explosions happening at once. This is where you tell Sound.js how to handle playing sounds of the same type. You can also create multiple instances of the same sound effect. If you are still having issues with choppy sounds, Sound.js has some suggestions on using set timeout to buffer your sounds. Now your game is ready to be packed with explosions. Windows 8 is a touch-first OS. This means we should never assume a user will be using just a mouse and keyboard. Lucky for us, the Wizards and Redmen have created a simple, unified API to handle all means of input. Whether it is a single touch, multi-touch, gesture, mouse, or even a pen, we use that same MS Pointer API. I'm going to show you how adding touch support to our game is super easy. For JavaScript, this means simply adding an event handler to one of the MS Pointer events. In the Win8 game kit, we are looking at the MS Pointer Up event. This is the event that will fire when the player takes their finger off of the screen, lifts their finger from the mouse button, or removes the pen from the screen. Since we are using HTML5 Canvas as our drawing surface, we only need to add the MS Pointer Up event to the canvas reference. In this example, we are calling our event handler touch handler. And as you can see, touch handler simply passes in the x and y coordinate of where that touch occurred. 
What's important to remember here is that you will always get the X and Y coordinate no matter what touch input is used. Windows 8 is a reimagining of not only the operating system, but the hardware it runs on. These new devices will come in all shapes and sizes, and many of them will include sensors, like a GPS chip or accelerometer. Windows 8 makes it extremely easy to access these devices, and adds an exciting dimension to your gameplay. Using the accelerometer, for example, is as easy as making a call to the sensors API, and then adding an event listener for something like shake. This will give us the X, Y, and Z numbers when the device is shaken. What's important when using sensors like the accelerometer, though, is keep the device pulling to a minimum. You'll only want to enable the sensor when you need it, and then immediately shut it off when you get the result. In your game, this might mean only turning on the accelerometer when you know the player is about to shake the device. For example, maybe a certain power-up, and then turning it off afterwards. This is done simply by adding an event handler for the device, and then removing the event handler. Windows will take care of only pulling the device when an event handler is present. But don't worry, we'll cover more of this in depth later. I'd also like to bring up the importance of understanding the application lifecycle. First, don't terminate your game when it's moved off screen. Windows provides a consistent way for the user to access and manage Windows Store apps. Your game is suspended when it's moved off screen. By leaving the game's lifecycle to Windows, your user can return to your game as efficiently as possible. Doing so also helps provide the best system performance and battery life from the device. Don't restore state for your game after it was terminated as the result of a crash. If your game was terminated unexpectedly, assume that the stored game data is possibly corrupt. The game should not try to resume, but rather start fresh. Otherwise, restoring corrupt game data could lead to an endless cycle of activation, crash, and termination, not to mention bad reviews. Don't offer your players ways to close or terminate your game in its interface. Players should feel confident that Windows is managing their games for them. Windows Store apps should not display close buttons or other ways to exit the app. Windows can terminate your game to help ensure the best system performance and reliability. As you can see, this week is all about getting our hands dirty with the core technologies of what our game will be. Next week, we'll look at how our game can shine by taking advantage of unique Windows features. Remember, check the daily tips and the Windows Dev Center website for deeper information on making a great Windows Store game. I've been working with developers for a long time, and I've never seen people this excited. The rush is on, so let's get to coding.